Are they having a picnic over there? Without us? So you never hear me About the things we are going to do I'll be your eye in a bucket Mankind's a weekend We talk about my government You know something, Zozo? Every August 1st, Emancipation Day, there used to be a big picnic in this park. What's Emancipation Day? It was a day that celebrated the ending of slavery. I don't know if you read about it in school, but no. there was a time when people would take other people, and because of their skin color, they would seize them, take them away from their families. Why? Because uh, they thought that they were less than humans, and they didn't accept it at all. All kinds of people, for all kinds of races, they became involved in the anti-slavery movement. And eventually slavery was ended, and the day it was ended, August 1st, 1834. So every August 1st, for a long time, in this park here, people would come together to celebrate the ending of slavery. So that's the story of Emancipation Day. Wow. Thank you for telling me that. Okay. Are you going to go to the library and do some reading on it sometime? <laughs> <laughs> to me, Emancipation Day means celebration. It serves as a reminder of the oppression my ancestors faced back then and the oppression my people still face today. Emancipation Day means strength and resilience. To me, Emancipation Day means freedom, family, celebrating black history awareness, learning more about my family history, the opportunity to learn, especially for our young people so they can know about where they came from so they can be proud of their heritage today. It means freedom, it means change, and it means movement toward the future. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to day two of our Emancipation Day program. I'd like to start off uh, with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee's people, many of whom continue to live and work here today. The territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit people, and acknowledging this reminds us that our standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of Indigenous people. I'm excited about tonight's discussion. When movies about slavery come out, I'm always really interested in getting uh, the insight and thoughts of slave movies from other community members, specifically um, Black community members. And I think a lot of times too, uh, movies about slavery can often send Black viewers uh, through an emotional roller coaster. They're often sometimes really hard to watch. And I think it's important to discuss those feelings and those thoughts openly and without judgment. And to help me do that tonight, I have two amazing people that I want to introduce. The first is Lennox Farrell. He's a retired teacher, writer, author, publisher, and community organizer. He was and is among those advocating for social change in Toronto in the 1980s, especially, but not exclusively, with regards to issues affecting the Black community. He is a founding member of the Black Action Defense Committee, and in the 1990s and again in 2005, 
Brill was head of the Caribbean Culture Committee, which put on the Caravana Parade. Hello, Lex. How do you do? Thank you for those kind remarks. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And next, I'd like to introduce Christina Thomas. Christina Thomas is a community leader in the Western Hill neighborhood of St. Catharines. Christina is an active member of the Reichert Volunteer Committee, a talent-led neighborhood association striving to make a difference that creates a safe space for residents to learn new life skills, make friendships, enjoy community dinners, and voice tenant concerns. Part of the group's mission is erasing the stigma attached to living in subsidized housing by actively displaying the gifts and talents of the people who live in Rikert. Christina recently became an author and released her first book on Amazon this year, Can't Hold Me Down, I'm Wearing My Crown. She currently works for Bethlehem Housing and Support Services as a community support worker. She volunteers at New Hope Church and was one of six women chosen to participate in Seat at the Table, a political mentorship program initiated by some amazing women leaders through the city of St. Catharines. So thank you both for taking your time and giving your time to this discussion tonight. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay, so let's get right into it. The 2019 film called Harriet, and it was directed by Cassie Lemon, screenplay by Gregory Allen Howard and Cassie Lemon, and produced by Deborah Martin Chase, Daniela Taplin Lundberg, and Gregory Allen Howard, tells us about an extraordinary story of Harriet Tubman's escape from slavery and her mission and passion to liberate others through the Underground Railroad. So, Christina, I'll start with you. What did you think about the movie? Did you like it? Um, I liked the movie. It, it was good. Uh, I just felt like there were some parts of the movie that just felt a little bit inaccurate, maybe, was the wording, mm -hmm. and just didn't feel authentic. Uh, the character, Harriet, seemed a little bit Hollywood to me. <laughs> um, I, I did enjoy the movie, but uh, I don't know. She just wasn't my Harriet, as a lot of people I think were saying online. Mm -hmm. it just She just didn't have something was missing for me. Yeah. Okay. And, and Lennox, what were your thoughts? Did you like it or? Well, I don't, I, I'm not as um, receptive as Christina. <laughs> In terms of looking at Hollywood, I don't see much movies. Um, um, at all. I look at a lot of documentaries and so. And for me, I thought um, it was challenging in terms of uh, the information that could be have been included, and uh, as well as what was included. Mm -hmm. And uh, it moved me on many occasions to tears. Now, I'm a teary kind of person, too. I don't apologize for that. Um, but, but I um, I felt a, a lot of upliftment in it, mm -hmm. a sense of um, coming to grips with a kind of a reality that um, seemed so distant. I mean, the, the movies, I mean, pulled me, in, pulled me in, into it. Uh, like Christina, there were some aspects of it which I, I found <clears throat> interesting and uh, interesting only because they were included but uh, I think that by including them I, I guess we'll come to that point later on I'd want to, to elaborate on that point a little, little later on in terms of what was included and what as Christina mentioned might have been excluded okay perfect and and Christina you kind of spoke a little bit about this but when this movie came out there was actually a lot of controversy surrounding this movie mm -hmm. this was before it was released and then even after it was released and actually there was a hashtag not my harriet that was kind of trending on social media when uh, when this when this movie came out and i know one of the issues that i heard from some um some of the black uh, community was their dislike of having Harriet's character, who was played by uh, Cynthia Revo, who is a Nigerian, um, a British-born uh, 
a British born resident with Nigerian parents. And I guess a lot of people felt that the um, character should have been played by a black American mm. instead of a British born actress. What are your thoughts on that, Christina? Do you think it really matters? Um, I don't really think it matters. I mean, there, that argument has been made for a lot of British actors who play um, either Jamaican roles and mm -hmm. a lot of other African American roles. I've heard that happen a lot. Um, but uh, I just feel it didn't feel genuine for some reason when she was portraying that role. Um, a couple of just factual things for me were like uh, the fact that uh, in the movie they said that her husband was so kind of supportive of her decision to um, want to run away and then in real life or documented uh, historians were saying that he was not in fact supportive of her decision to want to um, break for freedom especially because fear for his own freedom and for his own livelihood it would have caused him strife with his masters and it, well even the fact that he was uh, potentially free, it would have caused problems for him and for the rest of the family members. So things like that. And then um, just other things with them saying that she had visions or that she had supernatural powers. Um, she was struck in the head as quoted um, in, the, in the movie, but she was struck in the head by a hard metal object, which caused her to possibly have like concussions and problems like that, uh, which would have explained her visions. But mm -hmm. um, at the time, she was not wanting to work in the house to do domestic chores and things like that. She actually liked to be outside of the home because she didn't want to be, as historian said, she didn't want to be around white people and white women at that time as well too. So she was working outside of the home and she got more in tune with nature and more in tune with the climate around her, which would also gave her a better understanding of the lay of the land for when she was escaping mm -hmm. to be able to help with her journey on getting the people to um, the Underground Railroad. So things like that, little factual things. But it, again, it also may be just the portrayal of her being Harriet. It didn't feel genuine for me. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you make a really good point because the movie does show her husband in a very supportive role. But I believe from, from my understanding, he had even threatened to tell her master if she, if she ran. So it was quite the opposite from my understanding. So it's very dry. I agree with you. Uh, Lennox? Um, my understanding of story is uh, not only in terms of the characters who today might play characters in the past, who might themselves have had been ambivalent or anxious or angry at different times in terms of who they were and what their experiences were. But growing in the Caribbean, I, growing in the Caribbean, I look back at what you call the archetypes the myths, the metaphors which surrounded us. For example, I remember as a, a young lad, I would have been around seven, eight. Um, <clears throat> in a school where I was, in Trinidad, a village called Movat. This is a village where many um, black people, black men had been, I was born actually in the middle of World War II. That's why my middle name is Victor. That itself is a kind of a metaphor for what how my, my parents and grandparents saw this war against the Nazis. And uh, we'd come out um, in the morning, we'd come to school, go to the classes and we'd come out and there would be the British flag, you know, a metaphor of um, colonization, a metaphor of our needs to be emancipated. And uh, we would all sing God Save Our Great Gracious Queen. And when she visited Trinidad, there we were standing for hours by the main road, long, long lines of students with a little flag. And she passed, we'd wait there for two, three hours, and she passed in two, three seconds, and get that chance to win. And uh, um, each of us was given a little cookie, a little yellow cookie. It had, um, it had um, uh, stuff in it to help us fight malaria fever. So that each mm -hmm. you eat a little cookie, and it had quinine in it, that sort of stuff. So when I look at story, like this story, and I look back at that, I look for the metaphors, the, the archetypes, the myths that, because at the end of the day, no, from my understanding as a writer, no change is really possible from one story unless you understand the myths in it and then put your own myths inside of it. So Malcolm X for me 
is a myth that that is opposed to or different from the monarchy of um, in, in Britain that under, under which we do. It's different from the anthem, the, the black national anthem. The reason why that came about is because we needed a different, another kind of anthem. To come right. back more specifically to the movie, um, no one can portray <laughs> seriously slavery as slavery. Even the people who experienced it um, can't genuinely re-portray that. I remember hearing my grandmother. I knew her. She died. Uh, she lived up to very old. She knew her grandmother who had been a slave. Wow. That's how, that's how immediate slavery still is. She knew her grandmother. She, uh, her, her grandmother's name was Dear Dear, and she was given that name because they had tried to sell her on one occasion, and her master had asked so much that he called her Dear Dear. So when I hear, and then one of the uh, one of the pieces of advice my our grandmother, no, that's on our mother's side, gave us, gave for my sister, sisters and all the, the women, is don't have children for anybody you don't choose. Think of what that means. Don't have children for anyone, because in those days, a black woman couldn't choose who she had children for. Her womb, mm -hmm. her womb, there was no, no money at the time, and the, and the womb of a black woman was 21 carat gold. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to buy a piece of property, you would um, calculate how many slaves and slave women would be required. And from the age of 13 to the 50s, those are childbearing ages. So a woman's womb was a vault for money. You see? So when I think of my grandmother and slavery, those are the things that hit me and come to me. And it comes to me as a continuance of an on colonization process, as an enslavement process that had no regard for humanity. So that when the men from our villages and others who went to fight in this war against the Nazis, when they came back to Trinidad, Unlike the white counterparts, they were still denied the right to vote. When I voted for the first time in my life, it's the time my father and mother also voted. Wow. I represented a people of my generation in Trinidad Tobago, represented the last generation after emancipation, born without the right to vote. Our children are the first generation born with the right to vote. So when I look at slavery and, and the film, these are the kinds of echoes of history that come to me but I want it to be genuine to help me now as I speak to our grandkids and speak to others to understand that what occurred then has impacts on us today. And mm -hmm. to back to the movie, as, as I'm not speaking a little long, I won't, won't talk much after this. Um, the, the portrayal of it to me, I thought it as genuine as, as it could possibly be. The metaphors used in it, the, the archetypes, the idea of bigger long, I mean, the very name, the very name is a metaphor. When you think of a black man, what does bigger long refer to? Yes. Um, who, when the clan hung a black man, what did they cut off of him? Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of a white man being, um, having his, his genitals cut off by the clan? No. Mm -hmm. The black man's genitals was, is, is, is a statement, a metaphor, in a way, to, against whites, uh, that sort of stuff, you see? So big alarm, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I I can only conclude this: the reason why his he he did what he did, the most brutal piece of action in the movie actually was when he kicked the, the, the Harriet's sister in the face and killed her, and okay. it hit me then that what we are looking at is what's considered black savagery. You see, white brutality can be justified if it is fighting black savagery. To be yep. a savage, you don't have to be fully human. To be brutal, you could be human. You could be white. You could be like mm -hmm. Hitler and be brutal. You're a human being. But for a black person, you cannot be brutal. You can be savage yep. because we are not human. We are not homo sapiens, sapiens. Yep. So those are the kinds of resonances that came to me as I looked at the movie. And mm -hmm. for that reason, I found the movie um, compelling and uh, informing. That's, that, that was my reaction. To it. Sorry for being so long, but... No, <laughs> please don't apologize. You are all here taking it no, in. No, no, and no. Thank you for sharing uh, yeah. your experience. Yeah. Doesn't say that yeah. white brutality is justified when it is fighting black savagery. Mm -hmm. So that 
big along, the people who made it, they didn't live back then. They live in today, our time. Yet they still cannot get over acknowledging the, sab the, the sovereignty that was the, the racist um, with slavery. So big along comes in to expunge white society of the brutality of slavery because in so doing, it just slavery was justified in fighting black savagery. Mm -hmm. So the person who comes out worse in that in that film is that black man. I agree. He, he should have been if anybody, he should have been ashamed to have to play that yeah. role, in my opinion. I, I agree. I agree. And I mean that was one of the, the, the things that stood out to me watching this um, video. And it's, yes. And it's one it of the things that I wanted us to discuss. And you know, for those of you who might not have seen the movie, um, I was going to get to to Bigger Long, <laughs> but I'll bring him up now. <laughs> so um, with Bigger Long, so there is a scene with a Black bounty hunter. And this Black bounty hunter is named Bigger Long, as Lennox mentioned. Um, I was a little put back by this. I was watching some of this movie with my son, and even he was confused when he saw this character. And he said, so the black guy is the bad guy? Like, that was his comment after seeing this. And I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, here we go again. So, Christina, what was your thoughts on that character, um, the black bounty hunter, Bigger Long? Well, I think um, Mr. Farrell uh, said exactly some of the points that I was going to bring up. His name alone um, alludes to the fact that male sexuality, which is perpetuating the subjugation of black males and stereotypes, just with the bigger long name itself, um, mm -hmm. which then went on to allude to um, black males being a threat to um, white society and the raping of white women back in those times. And that's when they were lynching them because they were saying that, oh my gosh, like these men and being all sexual and stuff like that, they could be harming our women. And they were lynching them for this reason. Reason and it caused a big problem. And mm -hmm. then in the scene that you're referring to, Erica, when he took out his anger on the young lady, I forget her name in the movie, but he brutally uh, beat her and then kicked her to death, like Brother Farrell had mm -hmm. said. Um, I just found that it was it was hard to watch because mm -hmm. it was, first of all, it was a woman. And the fact that he went as far as he did, like he beat her to a point and then he finished it off with kicking her in her face to kill her it was just unnecessary and it was black on black violence and it is just as brother Farrell had said was just savagery and it made us look so bad in the yeah. eyes of the white man and um the money that was used the money that was used for the whole reason that this bounty hunter existed was because they said to him, what do you want to use this money for that you're getting to hunt these, to hunt uh, the black people for? And what did he want to use the money for? He wanted to use it to go and get white women for um, the white prostitutes. So it was like, again, like, what is this going on? What are these stereotypes? What are we doing? We're, we're hunting our and hurting our own kind to go and sleep with the white women, which was the problem in the end and perpetuating the whole thing in motion. So it was just, yeah. it looked yeah. so bad. And I, and I find that that was really irresponsible. Yes. To put that in that scene, to insinuate that, the deception of your brother, the deception of your race was worth sleeping mm -hmm. with white women. Mm -hmm. yes. Like how, how dare you? And I did a little bit of research on this black bounty hunter because I really wanted to understand, was this a thing? Because mm -hmm. it wasn't, I, I don't know anything about after connecting with a local um, historian here and doing a little research on myself, she kind of explained it as if there was a hundred white bounty hunters, there would be one black bounty hunter. So they are almost non-existent. So what was the purpose of putting this fictional character in this story, right? And, and I heard too, um, just from my understanding that a lot of times why it was done was because, so this, let's say this one black bounty hunter out of the hundred, you know, he, he had, this person had their back up against the wall because run, run, runaway slaves 
the price on their head was usually a few hundred dollars. So back mm -hmm. then that was a lot of money. Yeah. And as a black individual, you're not going to come up with that kind of money very easily. Mm -hmm. It's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. So if you're not a free black individual and you want to, let's say, purchase your wife or purchase your child who might still be enslaved, you're going to you're going to wrestle within yourself now to go and make that decision to now go and turn in your brother or your sister mm -hmm. as a means to get that money. Mm -hmm. to eat, buy your food or to purchase, you know, a loved one's freedom. Yeah. So those were the reasons behind that one bounty hunter that might have been out of the hundred. But instead of putting that truth into the video, they instead turned it around to say that the reason for the betrayal <laughs> was to sleep with white women. So okay. I thought that was uh, pretty insulting and irresponsible. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I agree. If I may also, the number of times every time he was mentioned it was gratuitous it was um insulting for example he showed him one time with the horse he's the only person who has actually paid money and he seemed collecting the money for um, catching slaves and he was riding on a horse and he laughed when he got the, when, when he kind of gave a kind of a laugh when he, he's a huge guy mm -hmm. and uh, um he is uh, he 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 represents everything that um that the white colonial society thinks and thought of us. It isn't accidental that black men are still today seen as brutes, um, are considered to be um, irresponsible. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the necessity of white society and white history to try to use that as, a, not, not as an, a deliberate justification, but it is the impression that, that, that civilization had to deal with us okay. uncivilized and uh, therefore by any means necessary is what would be taken to deal with us as a people and it still continue it can uh, um, we i guess we get into a discussion of that later on does it continue mm -hmm. yes it continues it continues in terms of the shooting of black people yes of black men mm -hmm. uh, in a personal sense when i live in toronto yeah. i could be stopped seven eight nine times in a year by the police because i looked i always looked like someone mm -hmm. i was a teacher a writer um married person had my family so i didn't look like that to them i looked like somebody mm -hmm. in yeah. other words it, it was an on what i'm speaking about is the immediacy of this problem how how white society perceives slavery and racism Mm -hmm. they, yes. Today, in, in those days, um, you had what would be, be run, runaways. A black person who escaped was called a runaway because of necessity. When you when you ran away, you took your body with you. Your body had belonged to the slave master. So you actually stole. Yeah. You were a thief to run away with your own body. You were mm -hmm. runaway. Today, we are not, no longer runaways, but we are still at large. Mm -hmm. That's a perception. So a black mm -hmm. person, a black man is out. He is... The society and the policing to do, to, to, to do their job, they must make sure they're not sure what I might have, must have done, but there's certainly something I have done. And therefore, on behalf of society, they must pull me over and try to win or to see if they could eke out and squeeze out from me some implication. And uh, um, on one occasion, um, I have to use the word, I was pulled over by the police. It's about <laughs> 10 years ago, and my wife was in the car. and they said I, my, I was wobbling. So I said, well, if I'm wobbling, I was drinking, give me a breath of the lies of test. And you take one also to the police officer. And his buddy on the other side was looking at the car because my wife asked him, I said, why you pull this over? I'm going to use a phrase. It's a brutal phrase, but it's what he used. He said, he called my wife a nigger bitch. Just like that. Out of the blues. Out of the blues like that. Because she dared ask him, why did you pull us over? And we were fortunate. There were other people who had been yeah. shot in the car. So, uh, Sophia yeah. Cook is a young black woman in Toronto who was shot in the back couldn't, accidentally by an officer. Yeah. I'm not saying that this is what all people do or all police officers do because I've been stopped by more officers who were courteous and did with their job. But there's still that sensibility that we are no longer runaways, but we might still be at large. Yeah. And this idea of bigger young, bigger long in the movie um, he plays a central, central role of iniquity 
Mm -hmm. so we know iniquitous is the use to portray him by people who live in our time, but who still feel the need to be that gratuitous when dealing with the issue of slavery as an excuse. Mm -hmm. they must, it, is, it, it is excusable within, within, within context. And um, that to me is very troubling because it continues to be the reason why so many young people, black young people, are in prison. Wherever we are, percentage-wise, we are a high number in prison. There are shootings in our communities, all kinds of issues and so, for young men and that sort of stuff, young black men. And uh, I'm getting old now. I was hoping that before I passed on that some of this would have been minimized. In some ways there are changes, but, and I'll stop now. Um, I still live with a lot of grief, a lot of. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, thank you for sharing. I think a lot of us, you know, we have that that trauma, that undisclosed trauma that has been passed down um, through generations. It's not often spoken about. It's not often acknowledged within the Black community or outside the Black community. Um, intergenerational trauma. It's not really, it's not really discussed. And I, I also wanted to just mention that there was certain roles too that male slaves had, you know, and they were always um, worth more, the stronger they were, um, their bodies were always examined a lot, right? Um, to work in the fields, to do the hardest um, backbreaking labor. And it's still kind of similar today with, you know, when we're, when we're looking at Black men and the um, objectification of them and the way that a lot of times we will say, oh, he's really strong and he's, this comes back to the bigger long name again, right? And I, I remember there was a meme that I saw on social media that said, next time you see a young black boy, tell him that he could be a great doctor or a great lawyer or a great, you know, stop telling him that he's, he's tall enough to play basketball or he's strong enough to be a football player, right? Kind of re reinforcing those um, stereotypical um, thoughts of our people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I noticed too, something that kind of caught me really early with this movie was the scene with the Reverend, Reverend Green. <laughs> <laughs> and Reverend Green um, is giving a, a sermon for, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, he's giving a sermon and they're there and they're singing and you know they're all they're all together, but then after that he decides to close with a Bible verse, and I have that Bible verse here. So it's uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Col Colossians chapter Col three, Col 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 chapter three, verse twenty-two. Thank you. Slaves, honor your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eyes are on you and to curry their favor, but do it with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. So what do you think about that scene? And then um, Reverend Green using that, uh, quoting that verse from the Bible. What do you think is the significance of that, um, Christina? To be honest, um, I think that he was not really trying to stir the pot for them, like not trying to get them into trouble. He would, he was like trying to encourage them to fall in line, listen to your masters, to not get beaten, to not get into any more trouble than they already were. Mm -hmm. um, although it was not really working. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, you know what I mean? Like to just follow and do as told and to stay in line, be obedient. And because religion was a strong manipulator for these people at those times, you know, religion mm -hmm. is, is going to determine like the outcome for these people, you know, it's a stronghold for everybody. And for a lot of races, if, you, if the Bible says this, that's the law. But even um, aside from religion, when you're reading this chapter and I was looking over into it and um, basically slavery was not really, I mean, sorry, slavery was not really meant for it to be in regards of racism. It was about power and economics. 
So it was about them taking over in, in terms of um, being able to manipulate people, to be able to have power over you, to be able okay. to make you work the land for free uh -huh. and to be able to, to own you. So uh -huh. if they could do that with Bible, because your, your religion is how I can get to you, that's how they got to them. And that's the, how they were working the land. So I think that's how he was doing it. But the pastor wasn't doing that, but he was just trying to keep them in line and say, you know, God is saying this, so follow your masters. But the masters were using it against them in the terms of this is how we're going to get to you. Yes, very much uh, religious manipulation. Um, very much <laughs> he preached about obedience, right, and servitude, um, this, this thought of Black obedience. And I think it was interesting, too, because his character kind of changed as the movie went on. But, Mr. Farrell, what did you think about um, that scene with the Reverend and his, his Bible uh, verse quote that he used? The Bible, as I, as I know it, and mm -hmm. I know it thoroughly, having grown up with my grandmother, Augusta Wilhelmina Dubik, is a compendium of stories of that can be manipulated or that can be exalted and have been and have been and that particular um bible verse has been is a central to a lot of um, white racism still today um the i'll come back to that in, in a second the part the, the reverend the black pastor i liked him he, he or, or was he her father or grandfather he kept saying I can't. I haven't seen you, and he deliberately wouldn't look at them mm -hmm. because he, he, didn't want, he didn't want to lie when they asked him, mm -hmm. "Have you seen them?" And he said, "No, I haven't seen them." But he had. He he knew they were there. Mm -hmm. He he hadn't seen them with his eyes, and um one, and then one of the white um bounty hunters said, "Well, if he says he hadn't seen them, he hasn't seen them." But it was a it was a play upon words that seen he hadn't seen. And meaning that he hadn't actually looked on them, even though he had known that they were there. Mm -hmm. I'm tr I'm trying to finish some, some, something before I die. God help me to finish <laughs> a series of um, stories. I'm um, trying to write for, for TV. And the the theme, the, the juxtaposition of themes is on one hand, there's a story of uh, compassion. And the and the basis for my thinking through compassion is a story in the Bible, the story of the Good Samaritan. Okay. That here's an individual, only long, not preaching, but but if you if you if I do you have to pay me something. I, that's a terrible joke. <laughs> Just stop trying to be humorous. I feel every time. That that here was a man who uh, was telling a story. It was very descriptive. And he and he and, and another man, a lawyer, said, "Well, who is my neighbor?" It was a kind of a, a question that is off. And he told a story about a man who went to assist another who had been wounded by by, by robbers. Took the man down, left him in an inn, and then told the innkeeper, "Take care of him. When I come back, I'll pay his bill." The crux of that story is that the man. Tell the story, Jesus was a Jewish. And the man who asked him, who is my neighbor, was also a Jewish lawyer. And here was Jesus telling a story about a Samaritan going to defend someone who they would be at war with each other. In fact, the shortest distance from where the man was to Jericho, um, down to where he was going, would have been in the valley, through a, val a valley, through a village owned by Samaritans. But he preferred to take the long journey over the mountains where there was dangerous. And the, the point is, of that story is, for me, the, the, the necessity for compassion. That I, in, in regards of my experiences with racism and my family's racism, it is not selling out or so not to be embittered by it. If other people use their humanity to diminish themselves through diminishing me, I must not follow their pattern. Mm -hmm. I cannot live. You, you can live somebody's lie, but it is better to live your own truth. And the truth being, being honorable, being compassionate, mm -hmm. 
being thoughtful. It doesn't mean backing down or that kind of stuff. And so it means taking risks with your own career. Mm -hmm. But we have one life to live. And in this life, if I, if you can assist one person, regardless of who they have to find their way to who they should be, I think that is sufficient because all of us who live, we are people of eternity. When we pass away, mm -hmm. we'll never ever be, again be another person who would be me or you. To all, so for that reason, while I am here, I okay. must take every opportunity I can to make life different and better for another human being, regardless of who they are. That isn't selling out. That is acknowledging my own humanity in the face of others who refuse to acknowledge mine. Okay. So in that sense, this, I, I, I thought it was very um, fitting that that biblical verse be read of slave of what was done because that was used to manipulate um, society. Mm -hmm. And uh, the two reverends, remember I talked of archetypes, of, 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 of um, they too represent two different types of truth in terms of the, um, the, the black pastor and in terms of the white preacher who said what, he, what said what he had. And as we live today, the value of these things is more than just talking about them or remembering them. It is internalizing them as much as we can and making them a part of our beings. We'll fail more times than we succeed. I don't have no problem with that, except that mm -hmm. I get up every time and try to move on. Okay. Okay. Was it too long? <laughs> not at all, not at all. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> um, you know, and we kind of, um, we kind of spoke a little bit about um, going back to uh, Bigger Long and his, his role in the movie. And I think it was, um, I think it was you, Christina, that mentioned the scene with uh, the character's name was Marie uh, Buchanan, I believe. And she was a black woman in, in the movie that was also uh, part of the Underground Railroad mm -hmm. and supporting Harriet and other people. And I just found it kind of ironic that, um, in, in my opinion, anyways, the most brutal scene in that movie was a um, was him, was him punching her and he stomped her and I, you know, I remember seeing that scene covering my mouth when, when I saw that I couldn't believe it. And I thought it was kind of interesting that for a movie that w was about slavery, um, that was the most brutal scene. Now I'm not lining up to see um, videos about the mutilation or abuse on black bodies. I think we've seen enough of that already circulating on social media, but I feel like it's almost not, um, it's not giving an accurate account of um, what slavery was really like for the enslaved uh, people during that time, you know, and for a movie that is about slavery, I didn't, the, the most, the most brutality was done by a black man. I thought that was, that was kind of ironic. I don't know, Christina, if what you thought about that. Uh, I thought the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, in comparison to other slave movies that have come out, um, I felt that like that didn't have to go to that extent. And um, for instance, like I feel like Django, if we want to talk about another movie with slave history and a slave movie, like Jamie Foxx did a good portrayal of that. And it was kind of a little bit more balanced. You saw the slave masters, but you also saw him highlighted as um, saving the slaves, going back and looking after his wife, protecting her was a better image of a, a man and a woman's relationship there. Mm -hmm. And, and he was championing that. And um, it was just an overall, better feel of like the slave master and he played a role of even kind of like a bounty hunter in that one um and that whole relationship there was a little bit better explained mm -hmm. i just i just felt it, it, was, it was a little bit better done and you actually felt empowered watching that movie when i came out of that movie and i seen a lot of black people going to that movie you felt hyped up you were just like oh my gosh like look look how black people overcame that situation and a lot of people just felt moved by that you watched it and the, the emotions that came out of that were just raw and natural when i watched the harriet movie i just felt a little bit like 
saddened for the characters okay. and just kind of hurt a little bit by how it was portrayed and, mm -hmm. and wondering if certain things could have been done a little bit better. Yes, definitely. And that reminds me of another scene um, right at the beginning. I don't know if you remember um, with the master at this time, after Reverend Green um, finished his, his sermon, he approaches the, the group of slaves that are standing there and says, y'all enjoy your Sunday now. <laughs> and then says, the cook's going to have some gravy for you for your corn pone later. And I'm like... So no, that, you know, that's really not accurate. It, it almost paints him as a, this kind individual who was, you know, giving them a Sunday off, <laughs> you know what I mean? And Cook's got some, some food for you after too, to enjoy your Sunday. And that wasn't the case. I remember traveling to New Orleans and it was, it was really a spiritual journey for me. And I got to go on to the plantations and I remember hearing one of the stories um, by one of the, uh, the, the people who were, you know, giving the tours and stuff. And the number one reason that Black children died on these plantations was starvation. Right. They died, they literally died because they were hungry. They were being starved. And then another issue too with um, Black children and also mixed race children is they were they were being killed they were being murdered by the the mistresses right by masters wives because she was angry at the union between and i don't want to say union i'm going to say rape because that's what it was yeah. the rape of these slave women and their husbands you know and that connects back to so many other things and why we have the issues we do with this thing called um the feminist movement Right. And that that distrust that we that we still have. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So. If I could, uh, this is, uh, it's, it's a lot to take in, you know, and I want to I want to be mindful of the time, but I also I want your thoughts. What 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 do you both think about when people say, you know, sometimes we hear a lot of comments about slavery in general and people will say, Oh, it happened a long time ago. <laughs> slavery, slavery happened a long time ago. You should get over it. Mm -hmm. Christina, when you hear those kind of comments, what, what goes through your mind? Honestly, I think that a lot of people don't take into consideration that slavery still exists. Slavery is still very real and happening. Mm -hmm. um, even in the area that we live in today, um, people may not happen realize that it happens in workplaces. It happens in... Um, uh, biases that we might carry that we don't even realize we might make a comment or a joke and not realize that the comment or joke that we're saying could be hurtful just by what we're saying it's like the little the little hint of the joke itself is just like that's not okay and um, the other thing that uh, in the movie uh, both in Django and this movie here um, racism against black within black people itself is another thing that that not talked about as well. And that is starting um, by inter interracial racism. Um, it's a form of internalized oppression that started with the um, racial hierarchy in which a constantly um, white people are ranked above people of color. And it's a racial classification system, which is across different races above uh, around the world. And it's linked to poor health outcomes, Caribbean and black people being a higher um, proponent of black violence, um, increased domestic violence among Native Americans. And it's also what um, was in the movie where you're talking about light skinned people back in slavery times are working in the houses and the dark skinned people are working out in the field. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they feel that the light skinned people are, are more appeasing to the eyes and could be trusted inside of the homes. Whereas mm -hmm. the darker people might be more stronger or they're more built for the field work. And that's still happening today. They might, the light, they might feel that the light skinned person could get the higher office job. Whereas the the darker skinned person is not suited for that kind of job and they want them to work, let's say, a housekeeping or something like that. So examples of those kind of things is still happening today. Um, they might say that a darker skinned person is more likely to be causing a crime. And that's why that they are, are 
stereotyping them and, and discriminating against them like that. And, but black people also do it against each other. Black people mm-hmm. are, and it's sad. And it's the truth because mm-hmm. black people might say, I remember when I was growing up and my black friends were like, oh, you're whitewashed, why? because you're too light skinned and it's sad. And that's why we've got the My Black is Beautiful movement going on because mm-hmm. we want to recognize that whatever your skin color is, whatever shade of black you are, you're beautiful and you're, mm-hmm. and you're worth it and you're amazing and God made you just the way that you are for a purpose. Mm-hmm. So these things have some come back all the way from racism times with the slavery till now and they're still affecting us and people are still struggling oh, yes. with these comparisons today. Yes, very, very much so. Even the way we see each other portrayed in the media, right? A lot of times, um, or, you know, maybe at a certain job, it's usually the lighter skinned individual who's going to get that spotlight. um, And then we're we're taught to believe that, you know, African features are not beautiful and not, you know, it's not pretty enough, not good enough, all of these things. And this really is a lot of you know, like you mentioned, it's internalized racism. And it it started way back then, like you mentioned, putting the lighter skinned uh, individual who was a product of rape, right? We we need to understand that too, because a lot of times some slave movies try to uh, glorify unions (laughs) between um, slave women or or slave men. I'm not going to leave the men out either, because what's often not spoken about was that there was, you know, rape going on with the men as well, because a lot of times um, the slave uh, master's wife would have her picks of the what they called bucks, yeah. right? A lot of these plantations had, you know, breeding farms mm-hmm. and seasoning plantations where the slaves, slave woman's um, direct purpose was to breed, was to have children. The slave's man, slave man's sorry, position was to have children, right? That was their, some of the roles. And that's why I feel like, I I don't think um, like Brother Farrell, like you said, that we can ever have a movie that's really going to go into the depth of the trauma, the abuse of what our people went through. So when when you say just get over it, how? How, we're we're still trying to heal from that. I, I, I look at slavery and I, I call it legalized uh, human trafficking, because that's what it was. Uh, Brother Farrell, what are your thoughts when, when you hear people say slavery, just get over it? It happened a long time ago. If I can make three points um, and try to answer the question and to get back to the, uh, the question of women. Um, as I said at the beginning, the womb of a woman was the vault of America before the Civil War and after. There was no other currency. They had broken away from the British. They had fought the British. And uh, the womb of, of black feet of women, females from 13 to 50, was b- bankable. You could buy land. Do you see how today we have cryptocurrencies? Or you could use blockchain to purchase? Black women, the womb was blockchain in this hemisphere. That was a way of purchasing stuff, buying cattle, buying land, whatever it is. The womb of a black woman was 21 carat gold. Um, and the role play, so the, the, the box, yes, and the slave owners, with regard, and that's two other points regarding women, there were examples of a, a white man who have, had having children with a black woman, well, not having children, to, to reap whatever, and the, and the child, when trying to apply to become accepted as a white person, was refused. That's one. The second thing is that we think of slavery ultimately was an economic engine for building Western civilization. Let's be clear about that. The, sta- the state of Florida, of Flor- of, um, of Flor- not Florida, of, um, um, one, um, oh dear me, one of the, the U.S. states close to the Mexican, Mexico, at one time, they were breaking away from America because they were opposed to the new situations about um, um, after the Lord Lincoln Alexander, Lincoln, Lincoln, um, Abraham Lincoln, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, they were going to go with Mexico until the Mexicans said, 
they will never have slavery. And that is why some of those states in the South are still part of America today. They were, they were, they later could have been part of Spanish, Sp um, Mexico and Spanish speaking, but they broke away from them and came back to the white America because slavery was tolerated and, and allowed there. And to conclude this point, this issue of, of the role of women in fighting, um, to go back to Trinidad again, the role of black women have been under, in some, a lot of ways underrated and unfortunately too by, by black men. I'm not dumping on black men, I'm trying to be realistic. Mm -hmm. When we were trying to break away from the British after World War II in Trinidad and Tobago, one of the people who had gone to war was a man called Uriah Buzz Butler. He came back and he began to agitate for the right to vote. And in a country era, one, on one occasion where he was um, speaking, the British government sent, of all people, a black police officer, same big, long kind of thing, to arrest Butler. Here's Uriah Buzz, Buzz Butler, a champion for the right to vote, a former war hero, back home and very glad of support. And they send a singular black police officer to arrest Butler at a big rally in the South. Of course, bad luck for him. Do you know who dealt with that guy? Black women. They see the police guy and toss it over a bridge and pour pitch on and burn and put, put fire to him and he died. It's black women who did that. The black women have never been passive mm -hmm. or accepting of it. In fact, in some ways, they have been more, more because to keep the to protect their children, to keep their families together. Um, I mean, I, I know from my own family, the women, the women in my family are fearsome people. My mother said, when we had to go to school, my mother was turned night into day. And thank God she was married to her, my, my dad, who was a red skin man in Trinidad, they called him Beckenage. Um, that's Creole for black, for, for black white. Mm -hmm. He come from an Irish family that fled from Ireland through Cromwell and that, and he had come, they, he had, he's about four or five generations down from Ireland, where he born in country, County Armagh. And when he married my mother, and th at that time men his color would have children with women my mother's color, but they wouldn't marry them. When he mm -hmm. married my mother, his family broke away from him. So I never knew as a child growing what it was to sit in my, in my father's, in the lap of my father's mother. I never knew what this, my grandmother, my mother's side. Oh, I never once sat in my, the lap. I, I know it hurt my dad. All his life it hurt him. It's only when he became big and began to pass exams that there was a kind of reconciliation. But it was too late. Mm -hmm. I grew away from them. And, and this is what racism and slavery still does in the lives of ordinary people. I never once sat in the lap of my grandmother on my father's side. And I know he died grieving about that sort of thing. So slavery and the consequences of it um, requires us to be formidable, 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 unapologetic and formidable because it is our responsibility as well as our rights as human beings to tell the world, to educate the world about the evils of racism and of slavery and do it without apology. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, unapologetically speaking up against injustice and standing up for what you know is right, even if that means you're standing alone, right? It's very, very important. Even my family was standing alone. Mm -hmm. When we worked with the BATC, the Black Action Defense Committee in Toronto, one of the marvelous things that happened was the leadership of the BATC. Among the leadership was a man who was a professor of mathematics at the University of Toronto. They named the chair after him. And whenever I had been arrested, I, I was arrested quite regularly. Um, <laughs> with demonstrating that himself. I could always tell when he came, he's a lawyer, because they would stop calling me Lennox and say, Mr. Farrell. I said, oh, so my lawyer is here. And when he showed up, everybody behaved themselves. Do you know who he was? He was a white man, a white Jewish man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm a white Jewish man. When he showed up, Everybody behaved themselves. And I could tell when he came. 
And he, well, among the things he did, being a professor of mathematics at the University of Toronto, he went and did a degree in law to take young black men out of prison. He spent his whole life doing that. He told us it all. So, so these are the these are the kinds of circumstances and occasions, you know, that are also part of this tapestry of resistance to oppression and racism. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I, I feel honored to be here with you today and uh, to have had the parents and to have the friends and allies of her. Uh, and I, I don't feel that it's a special gift or anything we should. Each of us has a responsibility in the lives we live. Mm -hmm. And each of us must make it matter the most for what is upright, for what is just, for what is decent, for what is honorable, for integrity. And do it with um, panache, do it with a sense of calm, do it being angry when you have to be angry, and um, mm -hmm. being resolute when you have to be resolute. But always keeping our eyes on that prize. That ultimately, mm -hmm. we are all homo sapiens sapiens. And the way okay. in which as a teacher affect my students i can i can bless them i can harm them and i'm expected in the life i live now and each of us to do the maximum we could to bless as many others around us as is possible very well said that's my life that's what i think well i know between the three of us this this conversation could go on for another two hours but <laughs> You're tempting me now. No, no, no. <laughs> I think there might be some questions, I think. Um, or if anyone who is watching had some questions, um, we could probably take a few of those. Um, I think one of the questions I had seen was, um, why do you think Black Hollywood agreed to a fictional character like uh, Bigger Long? So, Christina, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think that they wanted a protagonist in the movie. Um, one, to make the movie uh, have some controversy there. And um, I think that they wanted to have some of those themes to play off of, to have the stereotypes, to have the... Um, the controversy with the whole um, woman and man relationship, mm -hmm. the the scene with the whole um, the the man taking out that animalistic brutality on and in there to have that big climatic scene. So they needed that for the film. Um, however, I just don't think that it went over well. The mm -hmm. the, the intent was there to cause those those things to have. To, uh, a talking piece for the movie. I just don't think that it went over in the way that they intended it to go. Yes, uh, very much so. And I think too, in, in Hollywood, a lot of times the creativity of the directors a lot of time is not their own. Yeah. And in order for certain things to come on the scene, it has to be in agreement by people who are in positions of power. Yeah. to allow yeah. that to, to come out, right? So I think that plays another role. How many movies do we have that tells us about uh, slave rebellions or what happened in Haiti? How many people know about the uh, the revolution in Haiti? Um, I, I When I heard about those stories, I was empowered when I heard those. And these are the kind of uh, pictures that I would like to see come out, films that I, I would like to see come out that shows that we weren't just um obedient slaves that was really not the case black people fought oh yeah and gave their lives for freedom not just um in the u.s but throughout in the caribbean as well and i've heard it referenced that you know um some of the most um that people were humbled when they learned the kind of treatments that slaves in the caribbean especially had so i really think it's not always, we can't always put all the blame on the directors um, and the producers. We have to look at who's allowing the stories to be told. Sure. Really, yeah. May I, may I come mm -hmm. in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I'm in agreement with you that there is an, an omission that is as serious as uh, um, what is put in sometimes. The bigger, the bigger long part. I imagine that that was a budget issue. 
that those who are financing it <laughs> felt that that isn't there to justify the other parts of the movie that, you know, that the white, in other words, white violence is justified when it deals with black savagery. End of the story. That's one. The second thing is that uh, the resistance by black people is often um, minimized. How many of us are aware that before slavery was ended in the British Empire, there was a black empire, a black nation in South America. They lived for more than 90 years. Black slaves, and, and I don't really say black enslaved people because we were never slaves. We were enslaved. Mm -hmm. Black enslaved people mm -hmm. established their own republic. And it took the French, the Spanish, all these nations, the same with Haiti. Many people are unaware why Haiti is the way Haiti is today. Haiti is a metaphor, is a symbol of what black resistance will bring to black people if you res if you resist white oppression, white suppression. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Haiti was a country, the Haitians, therefore the French, the British, the Americans, and the Spanish, those four empires, they fought at one time. On one occasion, one of the um, admirals um, of uh, the, the French, I forgot his name of hand, one of the active people, um, the, the leaders of the, the um, slave revolt, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. My dad loved Dessalines. In fact, our first son, when he's born, my wife and I, we named him Toussaint after Toussaint Louverture. Because oh, we understand okay. the, the significance of metaphor, of archetype. We call him Toussaint. Jean-Jacques Dessalines was in, in the northern part of Haiti, Capatien, and uh, the admiral on board the ship told him, uh, sent a message telling him, Surrender the surrender, or we or we or we burn, or we burn the town to the to the ground. And Dessaline told the messenger, he took he took a flambeau. Flambeau is a part of a, a torch, a, a torch to, uh, to a flame that he used to, to light. And he took the flambeau and went to a building and put it on fire. And he told the messenger, go back and tell him before we surrender to slavery, we rather blow like ashes in the wind. Before we surrender to slavery. Again, because they were free now. He said, before we surrender to slavery, we'd rather blow like, and he, they burned the town down to show the, the um, to show the, the French general how serious they were about it. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Haitian people are formidable people. If in North America today, with all respect, if you see black business anyway, it is likely Haitian or Jamaica, among other things. Mm -hmm. they're, for, they're formidable people. They fought, they, 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 everybody fought, but I have the highest regard for the Haitian people for what they do. And it isn't accidental that it is the, one of the poorest countries in this hemisphere because white society has a very long memory. Very long memory. And Haiti will always be. What other country you know? Yeah, the, the prime minister was murdered in his room. Another prime minister, um, um, I forget his name offhand, um, Aristide. The Americans landed a helicopter and took him, the prime minister of the country, and dumped him in South Africa. And the American Marines, what did they do? They went to the Haitian bank and took out all the all the golden, all the gold, that the Haitian bank, and took it to a bank in America. And and the Haitian people have no idea what that where that gold is, what it's doing. The Haitians also, instead of being paid reparations to slavery, they had to pay the French reparations. Yep. Mm -hmm. with billions of dollars, trillions of dollars, ultimately. Mm -hmm. So Haiti is poor. It isn't poor. It has been impoverished. Yes. And the violence there and those kind of things, white society, white imperial society, because understand this, that the society we live in harms white people, working class people, people who don't have the clout and the power. And the, they, they get harmed also in this society because it's a, it's a brutal society. And, and if you oppose it, as black people have, we are bad examples. And mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that in terms of the women, the women have resisted. Yes. And, uh, and uh, the question of bringing bigger long in, I, when I looked at it, I said, somebody had to be saying, this film will not fly if you don't put that in. The budget is going to go with it. So put it in to show that all, it didn't show all white people were bad, but there were black people who were worse than the white people. Oh, yeah. Make sure he kick her head and kill her. Mm -hmm. 
angel killing in the Let film. them remember that <laughs> scene. Let it be the worst scene. Oh, yes. So when you go to bed, you have <laughs> nightmares. You know. In other words, <laughs> Let it be the worst scene. we enslave them to protect them. Actually, you know, because mm -hmm. enslavement protects them from savagery. They are savage. They need to be brought up to be the rank of, rank of humanity, etc., etc., etc. And therefore. Mm -hmm enslaving them is good for them it's teaching them okay. to be humans and the, and and that that is that's what it is and today you go into the us all those southern states that fought against slavery the number of black men who are in those prisons and every prison bed is owned is a private sector somebody owns that and it's yep. get paid for every so that slavery never ended in america that's it right. was um, altered yes and if you want to see a good movie that talks shows that. Look at that movie about or, or the movie um, Life. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen it. L I F E. You should see that movie to see it, it indirectly points at what the life of black men in particular and black women are. But at the end of the day, it is people who suffer. Ordinary white folk, unemployed, can't pay the mortgages. And and, and I know I see they having colonized Earth, they're not going to colonize the moon and Mars. <laughs> You know, I'm asking myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking myself, heaven help us. Maybe, maybe even, maybe even God might be threatened. No, he may, even he might be enslaved too. <laughs> he better, he better watch out because he might be put in a residential school. God knows. <laughs> and uh, in speaking of it. We reflect also on what happened to the First Nations here yeah. in Canada, yeah. in the U.S., those mm -hmm. residential schools. Do you mm -hmm. know what it meant to a mother who knew that every time a child of hers gave at the age of four, they'd be taken away from her for the rest of their life? What did that do to families? Mm -hmm. to parenting, to children. The the children, children. children. At the age of four, away from the parents, and they may never see their child again. Or if they do, they're speaking a language that neither of you could speak to each other in. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge, if you, uh, uh, there's a, there's a, if I, if I don't mind, I'd mention a video that people should look at to look at the First Nations. It's called the, the Ballad of Crowfoot. The Ballad of Crowfoot. It's about ten minutes, and it shows the what happened to the First Nations in Canada. And how how uh, and and the ball. It's it's worth seeing the ballad, which was made by um, the um, Toronto Film Festival one time. The Ballad of Crowfoot. And it shows what happened, and what it shows in happened there too, is that when you do evil, it comes back to you because among the weapons used to fight people like Louis Riel in the North war against the First Nations here was a Gatling gun. World War One came, World War Two, and in World War Two, more than sixty million Europeans, white people, killed each other. Yeah, evil mm -hmm. doesn't run away. Well, and do you know what is the weapon they use? The upgraded Bat Gatling gun. The Gatling gun was reinforced to become the machine gun. And the machine gun was a principal weapon used in World War II to kill mostly white people, killing other white people. Germans, that can, and which black people went and fought and came back like folk in my village. And um, I, I was too small. To, but when I voted for the first time, it was the first time many of them voted, those who had lived, those who could still live. So what, what's the point I'm making? Every one of us, as, hope, as full human beings, have a responsibility wherever we are to liberate that place. But to be a place, um, I don't want to sound over-righteous or so, we're all guilty of, of, of mistakes. I know I've made a tremendous amount of mistakes myself. But I understand this too, that as the poet said, I will not pass this way again. And everything I can do that's good, no matter how small it may be, I must do it. It is my responsibility. Not doing it means I will not have fulfilled my, the, the time I spent on this planet. I have to fulfill every role in that to be sensible, to be humorous, to be, but and and, and be passionate about uh, what about goodness, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. I know I talk a lot, don't I? You should tell me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm enjoying everything you have to say. I mean, this you're, is. You're, you're I wish you're we, me, Eric, we, we need a part two. I think we we can't wait till next year Emancipation Day. We have to. <laughs> you guys will come back for uh, Black History Month or something. In case I pass yeah. it before that, I'll, I'll make a tape recording. It'll be five minutes long. End of story. Five minutes. <laughs> 
Thank you. No, thank you for sharing, um, Brother Farrell. I appreciate it. I think if we could just do one quick question, because I know there was a few, but we can't get to all of them. So we're going to do one quick one before we close. And it was, uh, do you think the overrepresentation um, of black on black violence was done on purpose? In this, like place? I said, nothing is more purposeful than a budget. Okay. And somebody said, this film ain't gonna fly if we have some part of it that shows a black person brutalizing other black people. That way, you can't, it will not justify slavery, but it would explain to some extent why it was not as terrible as it might be portrayed. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I stay. Okay. And uh, Christina? You know what, at the end of the day, I think that, um, like I said before, it was a necessary scene to cause a lot of controversy mm -hmm. and to stir up um, conversation to go forward after the movie was done with and for conversations like we're having for tonight, right? And it brought up a lot of uh, the uh, traumas that people are still facing today. And it's important to talk about these traumas because at those times, at that time, there wasn't an outlet for the trauma because if you're thinking about slavery, like who were they going to complain to their masters? Was their masters going to listen to the problems that they were facing? They had only their each other. And most of the times that they were expressing it was through song. And um, that was how they were communicating with each other. And so it was creating learned and if, if you were to complain, it was we, even now, it's still considered weakness, right? So you got learned helplessness over the years um, yeah. of 300 years of slavery, along with poor economic circumstances, social prejudice, homicide rates going up, economic poverty, drug, all of that stuff. So it's a lot. And I, I was just reading something earlier today, and a gentleman wrote in a quote, he said, members of the Black community are told that wearing a mask playing the game and being twice as good are the keys to making it in America. If we only knew how to act, racism would just fall away. This mm -hmm. is of course absurd because good behavior is not deemed proper to abrogate racism. Discrimination does not come with a dress code. And I agree with that completely because you could act the part, you could dress the dress all you want, but it, uh, what matters is the person inside. And it's not it's not about acting to become the the white version of, of what's going to be acceptable in society. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You are who you are. And I think that everything right now that we're seeing in the media where people are waking up and they're realizing that black lives matter, which is a great thing. And all lives matter. Um, it's coming to the forefront is is mostly because of COVID as well right now, because you know what? COVID had a good, it plays a good role in what's going on right now because this past year or two that we're going into COVID, nobody has had a chance to do a lot of anything because they've been stuck inside of their homes, which has given them the time to have to watch TV and watch the news. And if you weren't watching the TV and watching the news, then you wouldn't have seen all the trauma that's going on in the world and it being forced right in your face of all the injustices going on around the world. So COVID did have a big role in showing you what happened to Floyd, what's happened to the native children. So because we're locked inside of our houses and we're kept with only the TV and social media, we're now getting to see these things. And it's mm -hmm. great to bring it to our attention. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. But these are the things that have been existing for years all around the world. So I'm glad that we're waking up about it, but I don't want this conversation to end after we're done here today. We need to be on these things on a regular basis, that all lives matter, that slavery is still existing in its form of racism right now. And for many different races, discrimination is still out there and we need to be on top of it. We need to be looking for it. We need to be talking about equality. We need to be having conversations with each other about loving one another and how we can show respect to each other. Beautifully said. Thank you, Christina. Mr. Lennox Farrell, any closing statements? I want to just reinforce what um, Christina mentioned, that um, every one of us standing for what is right is a majority. Every one of us. It might be singular. Remember, when I first came to Canada in 69, I was traveling a bus, and in the front of the bus, a Greyhound bus, they said, everyone who is allowed to sit in any seat. Years later, I realized that a woman called 
You know who I'm talking about. Rosa Parks. Amen. <laughs> I just love that woman. She refused to give up her seat. She was a one person. And she changed the whole, I mean, every single one of us is born with the capacity to change the world for good or for evil. Mm -hmm. And all we need to do is not find the power, is find the guidance to empower one or the other, goodness or badness. Let's go for the goodness seat. Yeah. Yes, agreed. Thank you. Um, Thank you, you know, to both of you for allowing us to come together in this space to discuss topics that are of importance and need to be discussed in our community. And thank you to all of you who decided to tune in with us. I hope that you were able to take away something uh, from this um, discussion. And I hope that you were able to learn something new and I would like to thank Christina and Lennox for joining me tonight. It has been educational. <laughs> it has been inspiring. And I, I was honored to take part in this with both of you. And also to our viewers, um, I just want to remind you tomorrow night, the programming uh, continues with the engaging in uh, active anti-oppressive and anti-racism uh, practices. So if you have registered for that, I'm sure it's gonna be a great program and I'm sure you will have lots more to learn. So thank you everyone for joining us and have a great night. Thank you. Honor. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, thank you Brother Farrell. It's been an honor. Thank you very much.